We've got a couple of you on, so I'm going to go ahead and continue. Uh, we've got a, we are taking a break from our directions uh, series, and uh, we are going to be uh, looking at mothers today because today's Mother's Day, and it's an opportunity for you to honor your mom, to be a blessing to her, to show her how much you love uh, her and appreciate her. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at a mom in the Bible um, who started out in a rough way, um, but uh, uh, saw things turned around in her favor. Her name is Hannah. So let's open up to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're actually going to look at chapter 1, a good portion of that, and chapter 2. And that's an incredible story uh, about this woman named Hannah. Let me tell you real quickly what we're going to be looking at. You don't need to, if you're taking notes, you don't have to... Uh, uh, try and write all these down right away because we will be going back through them, obviously. But uh, we're going to see now we're, we're calling her the prosperous mom. We'll talk about why that is a little bit later. But we're seeing that she persisted in spite of her poor state. Talk about that in a moment. Persisted in prayer. Persisted in preparing her son. Persisted in promise keeping. Persisted in praise. Persisted in parental support. Let's pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 1. It says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. He was the son of Jero Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, real quickly in our in our opening section here, we see that this is not the ideal situation. First of all, this guy Elkanah has two wives. Uh, we've discussed this at length uh, on Sunday mornings as we've gone through Genesis. You know that this is not something that's okay. Uh, it's not something that God uh, uh, blessed them for. However, what we will see is that God can work, and he will work, in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the unfavorable circumstances, we'll see that God can work in a big way. It says at the end of verse 2 that Hannah had no children. And it says in verse 3 that this man, Elkanah, went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. So this, this, this uh, house of the Lord in Shiloh is actually a temporary home. It was a, a, a temporary home for God. It was the tabernacle or a tent of meeting where people could come uh, there to worship. Okay, So there Eli is the priest. He's got his two sons who are priests also with him. And uh, they were actually some trouble, which we'll hear a little bit more about later. But in verse 4, and whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. So obviously through Peninnah, Elkanah had sons and daughters. Evidently she was fruitful. She was able to have children. But here's where we begin to talk about Hannah in verse 5. Getting into our first section, she was persistent in spite of her poor state. What about her poor state? Well, we find out that her poor state was that she was childless. Verse 5, but to Hannah, he would give a double portion. For he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. So Elkanah had this wife named Hannah, and she was not able to have children. And so when they would go up to worship yearly, to sacrifice yearly, uh, at Shiloh, he would give portions to his family so that they could offer sacrifices also. And we see here that he gave to Peninnah, uh, Peninnah, sorry, Peninnah, and to all her children, sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave her a double portion because we're told there that he loved her. I don't think this indicates that he did not love Peninnah. I think what it indicates is that he had a special place in his heart for Hannah. And the reason we're told there in verse 5 is because the Lord had closed her womb. She was not able to have children. 
So evidently Elkanah had compassion on her and wanted to bless her and give her a double portion to maybe in his own way to make up for the children that she did not have, that she, she wasn't giving birth to. So we find that her poor state started with, consisted of being childless, but it didn't stop there. Because not only was she childless, but she was chastised. As you, oh, I'm sorry, let me just a slide behind. Childless and chastised. Sorry about that. Verse 6, 7, and 8, we read this. And her rival also provoked her severe, severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now, I want for uh, all of us, let's, let's take a break for just a second. I want you to understand something about our study today. Probably none of you are moms, uh, but you probably have a mom, okay? A couple of things I, I, I want to I do before you just check out and say, it's all about moms, I'm not a mom, what does it matter? couple of things I want you to understand. Let's talk about the guys first. Guys, you uh, probably have a mom or maybe a stepmom um, uh, that's, that's there with you in the same home, I'm assuming, for most of us. And uh, your mom is not a perfect mom by any stretch of the imagination. And, you're, and by the way, your mom knows that, okay? Uh, but she is hopefully, I'm assuming, doing her best to uh, raise uh, her children. And it is a difficult situation. And as we go through these each of these points, you will have something. If you will take note of the things that we are mentioning, you will have some things that you can pray about on behalf of your mom. Okay? We're talking about a woman who was persistent. Okay? During trials, maybe this is a strong area for your mom. Maybe this is a source of struggle for your mom. Maybe she gives in easily. Well, you need to pray for her, okay? But the other thing you want to do, guys, is that you want to begin to pray for your own wife. That's right. I said your own wife. One of these days, probably sooner than you think, you are going to end up being married and you will begin to have kids. What kind of a mom do you want for your kids? Do you want a mom that just gives in very easily or do you want a persistent mom? Hannah was a persistent mom. So you can begin now as you take note of these things to begin praying, God, would you please bring me this type of a mom for my kids in the future? Now, the young ladies, obviously, as I said to the guys, you, uh, as we get through this study, you'll have some things that you can use to pray for your mom right now. But there's an obvious, obvious uh, uh, separate application, and it's this. Uh, you ladies, for many of you, most of you, uh, years from now, it'll be a few short years, it'll move quickly, you'll see. You'll see that you are becoming moms yourself. You're getting married and having children of your own. What kind of mom do you want to be to those kids? Do you want to be a careless mom or a careful mom? Do you want to be a problematic mom or a persistent mom? Well, we're learning here what a persistent mom looks like, okay? And so it says that uh, uh, in verse 6 that she was provoked severely to make her miserable. So she was childless and chastised. Now, let me say something to the ladies in the crowd real quickly before we move on. You have probably at some point in your Christian life uh, been to a uh, seminar or a conference um, or a women's study, and the Proverbs 31 woman has been held as the model. 
And for good reason. The Proverbs 31 woman, the woman that's described in there, uh, should be held up as the model. That's why Proverbs 31 is there. But I want you to understand something today. I want to set you free. I want to help you relax before we move on. And it's this. Here's what I want to say to you. The Proverbs 31 woman was not born the Proverbs 31 woman. You see, oftentimes, I know that the ladies, that Proverbs 31 is laying on you like, hey, this is who you should be, this is who you should have been, like, what's wrong with you? Sometimes it's, it, it feels that way uh, 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 when, it's, when, it's, when it's put on the ladies that way. Like, hey, you need to be just like this, this lady here in Proverbs 31. But I want you to understand something about the Proverbs 31 lady. She was not born that way. It was a process. We're going to see that here in our study time. But it was a process. I want you ladies to understand, don't let anyone, no matter how Christian and godly they may seem, put a trip on you like you are supposed to be at a certain level, at a certain place, at a certain time. You must understand that as you surrender your life to God on the daily, that God will work in you and change you at his own pace. So all you need to be concerned about is surrendering yourself to God and allowing him to work in you and change you and make you into a godly woman. Okay? I want you to think about where we're at with this woman, Hannah, already. She's childless. We've just found out in verse 6 that she was provoked severely to make her miserable. Does that sound like a Proverbs 31 woman to you, childless and miserable? It doesn't even stop there. It says in verse 7 that therefore she wept and did not eat. So this was a woman who was childless, who was miserable, who cried, who lost her appetite. Again, I ask you the question, does that sound like a godly woman to you? Now, Hannah is a godly woman, but understand that she's in the middle of the process of being changed. And she's not running according to anyone else's pace. She is running according to the pace that God has set for her. God has his timing. We'll talk about that some more. And so it says that in verse 8 that Elkanah says, hey, Anna, uh, Hannah, why, why, are you, why are you so upset? I, I, aren't I better than ten sons? Well, Elkanah thought highly of himself, but evidently he wasn't enough to, to, uh, to soothe the hurt in Hannah's life. Let's move on to our next section, our second section, which is that she persisted in prayer, in verse, uh, beginning in verse 9. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And in verse 10, it says that she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, and it will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Now, you'll see, you see there that she's making this promise to God. If you bless me with a male, with a son, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to dedicate him right back to you. He'll be in your service all the days of his life. But did you notice before we get there, we're talking about her being persistent in prayer and a godly mom should be persistent in prayer, okay? Uh, now, they may not all be persistent in prayer, uh, but God is, is working and changing, and, and that's something to reach for, persistence in prayer. So I want you to see here what it says in verse 10, that she was in bitterness of soul, and then it goes on to say that she wept in anguish. What does that indicate to us? That she was persistent in prayer even though she was experiencing misery. It says here that right in the middle of verse 10, in between bitterness of soul and anguish, that she prayed to the Lord. That should tell us something, all of us, young ladies and the guys, 
that even in the midst of our bitterness and our anguish, that we should still be praying. We still need to be seeking the Lord. She makes this vow in verse 11. The next thing that we see is that she was persistent in prayer even when she was misunderstood, beginning at verse 12. And it happened. As she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Stop there for just a moment. I, I, these things are just piling up against Hannah. She's childless. She's chastised by Elkanah's other wife anguish of uh, a bitterness of soul uh, she wept uh, in anguish uh, she's all, all of these things are piling up and now she goes to the place of worship in order to uh, uh, to call on God and what happens when she gets there she's misunderstood how sad uh, when we go uh, uh, to a place of, of worship and we're looking for answers and looking for hope and help and we're misunderstood even there. It might appear to some of us that, man, nothing's working out for Hannah. And every time she turns a corner, she's getting pushed back down. She's getting pushed away from everyone. And now the priest, even in this place of worship in Shiloh uh, at the tabernacle, has misunderstood Hannah. How sad. But she says to him, no, it's, it's, I'm, I'm praying. My heart is, uh, what, what does she say at the end of verse 16? Uh, For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now, she explains to Eli. So Eli, realizing his mistake and misunderstanding her at that point, says to her, verse 17, then Eli answered and said, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him and she said let your maidservant find favor in your sight so the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad so as she goes there and pours out this burden first she's misunderstood but then uh uh uh, Eli realizes, oh, I made a mistake, and he blesses her instead and pronounces this blessing on her and says, hey, may, may God answer your petition that you've made known to the Lord. And as she leaves, her face is no longer sad. So she's beginning to be restored. She's lifted up. Verse 19 says, then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Now this does not indicate that God forgot about Hannah. He had not forgotten about her at all. As we're going to see, uh, there's a little phrase in the next verse that is, is, uh, describes what's been taking place. God had not forgotten about her. When it says that he remembered her, it means that he was finally answering her prayer. Okay? Verse 20, let's talk about that. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, meaning heard by God, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. So she finally has a, a child, and it's a male child. I don't know if you remember a couple of minutes ago, but as she was praying, she asked God for a male child. And here God has answered. Now, let's take a moment, all of us, to talk about this, to consider this. She had been praying evidently for some time, and God hadn't answered her prayer yet. Did you notice the phrase in verse 20? What does it say? 
the process of time. The process of time. So it came to pass in the process of time. We have talked about this lots uh, as we've been looking at uh, Genesis on Sunday mornings for a long time. We talked about the process. We talked a lot about waiting. The process of time. What that indicates to us is that God had not answered her prayer yet, but that he was in the middle of processing it, and that it was going to take some time, and that she was going to need to wait patiently, that she was going to need to persist. And that is exactly what we have seen Hannah doing. But understand that this is the way that God works the majority of times in my life and in your life. That when I ask for something, oftentimes he is not going to immediately answer. There are those times when he will. But for the most part, when we begin to pray for something, well, then he's got some work to do in order to prepare us to receive what it is that we are asking for. We may not be ready for it, though we think we're ready for it. So it was a process of time. I also want you to understand something. It is extremely important that this child, Samuel, be, be born and grow up at, the, at just the right time. You see, Samuel would become, this little baby that she's had, would become one of the most important uh, uh, prophets in the history of Israel. He would prophesy during the reign of Saul, the very first king of Israel, and then during the reign of David, one of the, the most important kings in the history of Israel. So the two worlds must clash at just the precise time. So you see, we ask, well, why didn't God just answer Hannah's prayer and give her a baby already? She's, you know, uh, 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 miserable and anguished and uh, uh, all of that. She uh, bitterness of soul and she's weeping and crying and, and, and losing her appetite. Why didn't God just go ahead and answer her? Well, he wanted to answer her and planned to answer, but he needed to do it at just the precise time. Can't just throw kids out there willy-nilly. He's got a plan already set up. And so you and I must also trust the process, not just because it's the process, but because God is the one orchestrating the process. And this mom, Hannah, was persistent in this area of prayer. Even when she was misunderstood, she was persistent in prayer as God continued the process. But we see here that finally the process has come to pass. She has a male child. She names him Samuel, meaning heard by God, because she said, I've been heard by God. Okay. Now, the next thing that we see is that a mom, where are we at, is uh, persistent in preparing her children. In this case, preparing her son. Let's look at it. Verse 21. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. Now keep in mind this time Hannah has a baby boy. So in verses 22 and 23, we find out that she was persistent in preparing her son, even if it meant doing it alone. Now, that does not mean that Elkanah was not part of raising the child. He certainly must have been. But at this time, when, she's, when, when they're leaving back to Shiloh to go and worship and sacrifice, she's willing to stay there alone in order to prepare her son. Let's look at it. Verse 21. Now, uh, I'm sorry, verse 22. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned. Then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So she says, listen, the baby's not ready to be left there with Eli. You see, she had it purposed in her heart and in her mind. I asked God to give me a male child, and that if he did, 
I would give him back to the Lord for service all the days of his life. He's given me a male child, so I'm going to keep my end of the bargain. But I'm going to make sure that he's been weaned. So she was still breastfeeding the child, and she didn't want to just go drop him off at that time. So she says, no, I'll wait until next year. I'm going to continue preparing the child. So it says in verse 23, so Elkanah and her husband, uh, I'm sorry, so Elkanah, her husband, said to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Some translations say, let the Lord establish your word. Whichever it is, the idea is that Elkanah is saying, listen, let God work out the details. Let God trust the process because the process is orchestrated by God. Then at the end of verse 23, then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. So this mom is persistent in preparing her son even if it means doing it alone. Let's move on to our next section. This is section number four, or, or um, a division number four. She persisted in promise keeping. It says, now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bowls, one ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the, the child was young. Then they slaughtered a bull, and brought the child to Eli. So they brought the, they slaughtered the bull in order to sacrifice the bull. And brought the child to Eli. And she said, oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. And in verse 27, for this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord there. She persisted in promise keeping even when it meant giving up her only son. Her only son. Most of us will have a difficult time understanding this unless you're a parent like I am, but I realize it's, it's probably mostly students on here. I want you to understand that she spent a long time in anguish, bitterness of soul, praying, yearning for a child. Now she finally has that child. For she made a promise to God saying, I'll give the child up to you, God, if you'll just give me that child. Now come, and now the, the time has come in order to release that child. And what a difficult uh, 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 task this must have been for Hannah to give up her only son must have been heart-wrenching. She knew that she would see him again, but still, she would be missing out on all of the things that moms enjoy. Seeing the child grow and learn and become fascinated with life and see all the funny things that small children do. She would not be experiencing those things on the daily. But she would see him perhaps only yearly as she went up to Shiloh with Elkanah to worship. And, and, so she, and, and, and yet she was persistent in this. What a difficult thing. I wonder if, uh, if that was not done with tears and uh, with agony in her heart. With gladness, yes. But uh, how hard it must have been for her to hand over her little boy, to this man, Eli. Now, it goes on to say in verses 27 and 20, I'm sorry, we already read that, verse 28. Let's move on to our next section. Uh, beginning, we're going to carry it right over into 1 Samuel chapter 2. We find that she was persistent in praise. She persisted in praise. Let's look at it. We're going to read uh, the majority of this uh, through quickly. Not a lot of explanation needed here. Verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is, is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. She's speaking to God. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more uh, so very proudly in verse 3. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty man are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. 
Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. So there she is persistent in praise, and it, it wasn't, a, 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 it was a prayer, but I want you to see that that prayer was filled with praise. There was a section there toward the beginning that I like. She's talking to the Lord, obviously, but then when she gets in verse to verse 3, Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. There, she seems to be talking to someone else. She wouldn't be saying that to God, obviously. Is she talking just to herself? Or is she talking to the enemies of God? Perhaps she had, she had penna in mind. Don't talk so proudly anymore. Don't be so arrogant. Whatever it might have been, or whoever it was that she was talking to, she persisted in praise and i think i put yeah i, I put uh she persisted in praise on behalf of her only son let's move on to our fifth section here beginning at verse 17 which is she persisted in parental support therefore the sin of the young men uh i'm sorry i did this in first service also and forgot skip down to verse 17 if you're in first samuel chapter 2 skip to verse 17 it mentions something about the sons of Eli, uh, Hopni and Phinehas. And I want you to see this only because it contrasts with Samuel. Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. Speaking about the two sons of Eli. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Uh, people hated going there because these two men were so wicked, these priests. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. So the contrast is this. My nose is just itching so badly. And I keep trying to scratch it little bits at a time. You know how that is? It's like you scratch it just a little tiny bit, and it doesn't do the job. So I might as well just take a break and rub on it. Sorry about that. Anyhow, Hopni and Phineas were wicked people priests and yet this little boy samuel there's a contrast there it says but samuel ministered before the lord meaning that even from his young age that he was a blessing to the people that he was righteous and dedicated to god okay sometimes it's a quick note for all of us um sometimes we make excuses for our behavior and we blame it on the people around us, the people that, you know, maybe it's our family, maybe it's our friends, maybe it's our outside influences. I want you to see that Samuel is being raised by Eli, and I'm sure by these two wicked men, Hopni and Phinehas. And yet his heart remains steadfastly dedicated even from a young age, he's not influenced by these by this this wicked influence. So enough with the, the, the excuses. Let's no matter the circumstances, let's dedicate ourselves to the Lord. Now it says here that uh, we're in this section persistent in parental support. Let's look at how. In verse 19, moreover his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year. Now, when I hear little robe, I immediately, my mind goes to Anakin Skywalker when he was little, 
he was dressed, you know, the way that he was dressed. And then they would show him with the other Padawans, the other young Jedis, and they would all have those cool little robes on. I immediately imagine Samuel dressed like that. I'm sure it wasn't, but that's how I picture it in my puny little brain. But it says in verse 19 that she would bring to him a, a little robe year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, and he would say this, the Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go on to our go to their own home. And I want you to see this in verse 21 because in verse 21 is where we finish. I don't know if you caught it or not. Oh, I forgot to put up a sub point here. Sorry about this. She persisted in parental support though they lived apart. She still would make a robe for him and bring it to him every year. So that's what parents do, right? They, uh, they just are, are good parents, will always support their children. Um, and that's what she's doing. I don't know if you caught it, but at the beginning of our study, I told you on that very first slide that this, the, the, the name of this study was The Prosperous Mother. The Prosperous Mother. And yet we've spent all of this time talking about the persistent mother. But I want you to understand that the reason she was prosperous is because she was persistent. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean that her persistence earned her prosperity. What I mean is this is that her persistence in all of these areas, what were all the areas in spite of her poor state? Persistent in prayer, in preparing her son, in promise keeping, uh, in praise, in parental support. She was persistent on all of these things and really all of those can be summed up this way. She persisted in counting on God. You see, and because her faith was, she had a persistent faith in God, and she consistently brought her cares, her concerns, her worries, her hardships, her anguish, her bitterness. She was persistent in bringing those things to God. What it shows really is her persistence in counting on God. And because of that, God honored her and prospered her, prospered her, and made her a prosperous woman, a prosperous mother. Here's where we finish in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. So this woman, Hannah, was a prosperous mother. We see that there at the end as God blessed her with three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord, meaning not just that he grew bigger or stronger or older, but that he grew in his service to the Lord, that he grew, that his spiritual life was growing that he was growing closer to the Lord, that he was growing stronger in the Lord. So we see that what was empty, Hannah's womb, was filled and blessed with many children. She ended up being a prosperous woman. And that's what I want you to understand today as we finish. That this was a process. Hannah was not born a Proverbs 31 woman. Your mom was not born a Proverbs 31 woman. You know that she's imperfect. She's no different from any other mom. She's in the middle of a process. God is in the middle of changing your mom. He's not done yet. So be patient. Be patient with her. Be patient with God. Let him finish his work. Let me share something with you. 15 years, it's been about 15 years now since my mom went home. She was a godly woman, 
wonderful mother. And uh, she got a disease called Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, Lou Gehrig's disease is a terrible disease, and here's why. Because what happens is that the, uh, uh, the, the, the muscles experience atrophy. In other words, the muscles stop working in the body. But it's not all at once. It happens slowly. In fact, so slowly that many people live for many years with their bodies slowly dying, the muscles slowly dying. They slowly begin to lose strength in their limbs, in their body. It's quite terrible. But there was something different about my mom. She, we found out after many tests that she had Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, she had been experiencing some, some uh, small issues. Uh, but finally, we got the word that it was Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, keep in mind, Lou Gehrig's disease oftentimes will last many, many years, or at least can. My mom, it lasted only a few months. It moved very, very quickly. And... I believe that that was actually due partly, uh, uh, due in part to, to us because we were praying for this. We were praying, God, would you miraculously heal my mom? Lou Gehrig's disease is a death sentence. Would you miraculously heal my mom? However, God, if you're not going to heal my mom here on this earth, would you please take her very quickly so that she's not suffering? And we believe that God honored that prayer and took her very quickly. Even people that are familiar with Lou Gehrig's disease are, are uh, 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 so surprised when they hear that she, that she actually did not live that long at all. In fact, that it moved very quickly through her body. The reason I'm sharing that is, is, is this. I want you to take the opportunity, if you've got a mom or a stepmom, take the opportunity to honor her. To understand, first of all, that she's in the middle of a process that God is still working out. She's not perfect. She won't be for a long time. Be patient. But take the opportunity to honor her today because life is very short. She will be gone before you know it. Nobody lives forever. Take the opportunity while you can to bless her today. I mean, it's one day a year. Use it to tell her. Sit her down. Tell her what she means to you, the things that you are thankful for. Maybe there are things that you're not thankful for. You don't have to mention those. Leave it alone. Mention the things that you are thankful for. Be a blessing to her. Do something for her today that shows your appreciation toward her and for her. We've been blessed with these moms. They're not perfect. We understand that. No mom ever will be. But God is changing them. And so we're thankful for that. Let's pray. Father, thank